Warning, this show contains adult language. Welcome to another edition of Up and In It. I'm your host, Adrian Babishoff, and if you're new here, welcome as well. And if you're wondering what the show is about, it's entirely dedicated to improving quality of life for both people and planet through liberation and independence, moving you from surviving to thriving and living life on your own terms. The urban permaculture backyard. I have not done a lot on permaculture lately, so I figured we would start with one and what better place than your own backyard. Now, you gotta figure out if this is worth it for you. Um, there's a lot of things you gotta understand about your soil health. Is this a, a good return on investment in ROI? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, building habitat for, for animals and actually working with nature in such a confined space, is it possible? Well, let's talk about that. So let's get started in right off the bat here. The soil building and health. Uh, why would I put soil building? Because most, most of you guys aren't probably aware that when you live in an urban environment, uh, you know, they have to scrape. You ever seen like the new plots where they're building new homes? If you look, it's completely flat. They actually will come and level out sometimes an entire hill. They'll take all that soil and they'll move it to wherever they can and dump it off. But what you've got there is soil that's never seen uh, the sun, that's never seen vegetation. There's only so much uh, penetration that roots and trees can go down and actually cause life and cause a balance, an equilibrium for soil microbiology and things like that. So most of you guys are probably living on soil that has been scraped away. Now you gotta understand organic matter and stuff, depending on where you live, there's only so many feet on the top. That's where the abundance, always as we say in permaculture, is the edge. Wherever there's an edge of something, there's the most abundance of, of life. There's mo different microbiology, a lot of different things going where the edges meet. Well, right at that top soil, that's all been removed for you. So most likely, we're going to have to build that up. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether this property was, say, uh, done like built in like the 70s or uh, maybe 10 years ago. It takes a long while for that microbiology, for that soil to, to actually heal itself, depending on what was done and what kind of environment you live in. So we definitely, regardless whether your soil is good or not, we want to start building up soil immediately as soon as possible. And we want to check out the health of the soil. So if we're going to go for a permaculture backyard, before we plant a tree, a shrub, a vegetable, wild edibles, anything, the very first thing we're going to want to do is check out your pH, in my opinion. You need to know what that pH is because, see, the significance of this is most things, which is very fascinating, most things need to a pH balance of anywhere from 6.5 to 7.2. This is the acidity, acidity and the alkalinity inside whatever we're measuring. In this case, it's our soil. What's interesting, though, is that your body will function the best at, that, at those pH systems. Your urine should come out and your saliva should come out at these at 7.2 to 6.5. The water that you drink uh, is, a, is best at 6.5 to 7.2. Aquaponics water, if you're growing fish, with a uh, food the best pH is 6.5 to 7.2 you may hear a little bit of variations but that's pretty much right there in the sweet spot and the reason why is a lot of nutrients are locked up magnesium copper uh, ph phosphorus all of these different things if it goes too acidic it blocks out certain uh, um, nutrients and things like that certain uh, uh, vitamins and minerals whereas the sweet spot is between 6.5 to 7.2 you do not get the full capacity of everything but you do get a general multivitamin basically for whatever it is that you're doing so you'll need to know because in some cases especially if that soil has been scraped in the, your backyard you may have a high alkalinity like we do here in, in north county san diego california there's a lot of alkalinity in the soil and that's not bad it's, it's not it's not very good it's not very bad but it could turn to where you're going to grow such acid loving things as blueberries and they're not going to do too well in this soil so what would you do you would probably want to get yourself some pine needles or some sort of something that's going to have some acidic values in it and either pot up some of that soil try to get yourself a good mixture or if you're growing in the ground stick a bunch of pine needles over that area and and just keep that keep it up keep putting those things there to keep that area uh, acidified because we got to think of our soil like a sponge you can imagine if you had a wet sponge and you placed it on your uh, kitchen sink and then you took a bunch of dry sponges and surrounded it. What's going to happen? It's going to leach all that water out into the other sponges and evaporate. That's constantly what's happening. you got to imagine you're not living in your little paradise, your little sponge. It's a very huge, giant sponge. And if we're going to go and try to throw such things as pine needles using a natural resource that, uh, to acidify some uh, uh, ground, some soil that's uh, the very alkaline, What's going to happen? It's just going to start leaching away. 
I want to talk about water and stuff like that too because that's very important. So yeah, you got to know your soils and you got to know what you're working with and then you can start planting accordingly. Uh, that way it gives you an idea whether it's too acidic, too alkaline, because you start adding uh, different types of compost, blood meal, bone meal, feather meals, uh, whatever have you, all these amendments. And I think that's where people get wonky in their backyards is that things start to uh, uh, get get out of balance. So you may be putting more acid on an acidic soil and now you've got problems and things won't grow. Uh, ask Jeff Lawton, uh, the prince of permaculture, what would be like if he can get two things, what would he get? He said he'd get a soil test and he'd also get a surveyor's uh, a level. Uh, those are the two things, the major uh, two tools that he thinks are the most uh, strategic and most important. So yeah, soil building, and we can make a whole entire show off this, and I would really, really like to do long, long shows. I just can't afford my budget to do this because I run a few other podcasts and stuff going on, but... Uh, we're going to try to keep this one down to 20 minutes. So we're just kind of brazing over. I'd love to hear if you guys would like me to zero in and niche down on one of these particular topics. There is an email down at the description below where you can get a hold of me and do so. All right. So size matters as well. Uh, size matters as well because I was telling you about the absorption of the vitamins and minerals that you're going to start uh, amending your soil with and building your soil health. Well, size matters because... A larger area let's just put it this way I'll kind of give you guys a lesson from aquaponics there are a lot of things that can change very quickly uh, in, in an aquaponic system and say a greenhouse is another good example in a small aquaponic system whether it's a disease or a change of pH happens very quickly because it's just very small space right you have a tiny little area but say you have a backyard that's I don't know a tenth of an acre or something a lot of different things can happen in there if you start putting additives or just heavy rainfalls and things like that to wash things away whereas in a larger space like a larger greenhouse is the same thing if you have the Sun that comes out to heat that it's gonna heat up very slowly and it's gonna gradually cool down very slowly whereas a small little tiny greenhouse will get so hot so fast uh, within like an hour, it'll actually burn and bake your plants. So you want a large area. The larger you have, the more room it has for things. So uh, size is a, is a very important factor if you're going to start doing permaculture because permaculture also is something that doesn't happen overnight. It's not like you just go and throw nitrogen and stuff the way we've uh, originally been doing farming and gardening and things like that. We want to start introducing things naturally. So in a very small space, Things can happen quick, but I think you have to be careful of even such natural things as clamshells or pine needles and stuff like that because you could get a concentration very quickly uh, nudging nature to just make this big change. And then equally, you get a big rainfall and you don't have enough places to divert water. Uh, it can wash away all your work and then you're back down to zero. So size matters and especially matters uh, when we talk about ROI, which is my next uh, note here. Because if you're really looking to feed yourself, like on a large scale, you know, not to say it can't be done in small scale, but if you're looking to really make a difference, it's kind of difficult when you're living on just a very, very small tenth of an acre. Now, it's not impossible. You can do a lot, but you're taking away and you're utilizing every square inch to where you don't even have a backyard. It's all for planting, right? So it depends in which context you're coming from. What are your motives? Are you really looking to put a, a dent in your, uh, to save some money and really start producing food? right then you're going to need something a little bit bigger uh in all of my research and all of the years that i've seen it basically will come out to about an acre per person to really feed yourself uh 100 and i think that's even debatable so but i think it's something great and and, and necessary that we should do we should practice permaculture in uh, any aspects in any places that we can it's just that i don't think that you're going to get a return on investment very quickly in a small uh area and I mean, there are a lot of things you can do, but they're limited with that amount of space. So if you're gonna spend the time and you're gonna spend the money, um, it's something you might wanna take in consideration. Like to me, the if someone asked me, what is the best uh, site? What would be the, the best size of the site? I would say that that depends again on your experience level. If you're not that experienced about 
a quarter of an acre can keep you really, really busy. We start moving to a half an acre of just, I'm not talking just full blown production where you're trees, you're growing plants and things like that, practicing doing berms and hookah cultures and whatever have you. That's when we start to get into a really good sweet spot. I think even an acre, but it all depends who's printing the bill, who's buying the, the paying the mortgage and the property taxes, you know, things like that. Uh, well, you can go ahead and work on that farm, right? This is over your weekends and, and things that you, whenever you get the time to be able to do those things, if you're so privileged. So ROI and, uh, and the size, I would say it's, you're not going to get it very, very quick. As I said, we're putting natural systems in, we're developing, so it's not a flip overnight. I do have some strategies where you can use wood chips to actually regenerate the soil, rebuild soil, create soil. And what you can do, in my suggestion, was, is to start off, especially if you're just beginning permaculture, is start planting some vegetables inside of uh, containers. All containers should have uh, holes in the bottom to let the water drain out so we don't get flood and bogged down and kill the plants. But you're going to want to strategically place these things. I call this the soil tractor method. And this is where, for my biodegradable container gardening systems that I've invented, and you can check that out at biodegradablecontainergardening.com. There's also a YouTube channel about it. Uh, we're just in our beginning stages. But the concept is, is that you would lay, let's say, you know, most gardens have like a four by eight foot uh, bed, right? A raised bed. Why don't you go and just stack a bunch of wood chips in a four by eight formation, get yourself a bunch of containers, grow some vegetables, place these containers just as you would in a raised bed right over uh, that area of the ground. And what you can do is all of the juices from the compost, the worm castings and blood meals, bone meal, feather meals, whatever you put calcium, all of that kind of stuff starts to leak down in through the wood chips down to the ground, which gives vitamins and minerals for the microbiology. Uh, uh, the plants, if done right, in my systems, which are burlap sacks, which we're growing in, the roots are penetrating through the burlap sacks. They're reaching down in through the, the wood chips and they're placing their roots down there to give something the worms to feed on and actually feed on themselves to get whatever nutrients are in that soil depending on the depletion level. So this is a soil tractor building system. And again, this doesn't happen overnight. I would say the magic year is probably about three to four years. And I'm gonna let out a little secret of something I've been working on. This is my no-till uh, method, meaning that let's just take that four by eight foot garden that you grew. All of us know or should know that soil needs to rest. Nature needs a rest. It's not our, our servant, our maid. And what we need to do is grow some food on it and then just kind of let it sit feral for a little while. Let everything kind of rest. So in my opinion, you would go and you would harvest some food one year, maybe two years. By the third year out of the soil, which, which I mean, uh, once it's built up, and, and you're going directly in the ground, after about two years of growing or maybe every other year, uh, what we'd wanna do is not plant anything. Just stack a bunch of about a foot of wood chips over that area, place our container gardens over that and let that just sit for a while. And as the, the year goes by, what's happening is all the wood chips are decomposing. The roots are kind of going in there. They're getting some nutrients and things like that. But a lot of the juices and stuff are revitalizing the ground again, right? So we don't even have to flip the dirt over. Because a lot of you guys probably don't know it, that talking about surface again, that the surface is where all the microbiology and stuff are creating all the organic matter. They're chewing stuff up. They're pooping, peeing, breeding, dying. The worms are right there at the surface because it's nice and cool and moist and there's oxygen. And when we remove those wood chips, we usually expose all of that. So what we'd want to do, instead of removing the chips, then getting a blade and literally slicing up the ground and flipping it over, which pretty much kills everything, leave all everything at its home and in its, its natural state. And what we'll simply do is poke little holes with our fingers or a stick, plant our seeds in there without turning anything and let things grow. Uh, when we're done with it for, the, for that year, we'll simply cut off our, our plants, maybe lay them in the dirt, cover them up with wood chips, and you get the point, and then we're gonna let that sit for a whole year. That way we always have uh, vitamins and mineral remineralization of the soil and, and the soil health and the microbiology to build itself. But again, this comes back to ROI. This comes back to, uh, well, actually more than ROI, it comes back to size. If you've got something small and it's unproductive for a whole entire year, that's that's a four by eight foot on, you know, a, a, a quarter or tenth of an acre that you're not able to use yeah, I don't know if that's going to fit the way your lifestyle if you really want to have an ROI on it so that's why size to me doing natural farming and permaculture sometimes makes a big difference now, I want to talk about building habitat uh, very important here 
I know a lot of us want to produce our own food, especially in our backyards. The problem with urban gardening and, and urban living is that we've cemented everything off. We have we spray pesticides and herbicides and we've we've grafted, we put trees and things in places where we think that it's going to be work well, where it's the best, uh, maybe not so much as uh, um, uh, useful, right? But it's aesthetically pleasing. But it's got what are what is its its structure of, of usefulness, right? I'm more into the way things, the functionality of things, and then instead of the aesthetics of things, as you can't tell from the way I dress, the way I live, the car I drive, and all of that. But yeah, what we owe to nature and it's beneficial for us is to build habitat. Now I did a show called Food, you know, uh, uh, lawns, food gardens, not lawns, and we were talking about if you have a front yard in an urban uh, uh, setting. You can actually use that to plant flowers and to, to place stones and things like that. I had bricks that I was uh, salvaging, right? And I, I stacked them all up. And I noticed that a lot of lizards would go live in them. So I did an experiment where I took a bunch of stones that uh, I gathered out of my garden, building hoop culture beds and stuff like that, strategically put them in my garden, a big giant pyramid, if you will. And what happened is a lot of the... Uh, Lizards would go and move into that. They'd hibernate at nighttime, you know, or and during the uh, winter time, and it gave them a place to hide. I never knew that storks, uh, egrets, they ate uh, um, lizards. I saw them up with their wobbly heads, and they were snatching up all my lizards. If you got a pet cat, you know, they're going to come and start uh, killing them off as well. But you're creating habitat for snakes and and guys, snakes uh, go for snakes. They are, they will bite if you step on them, but most of the time you won't be able to find them because they're scared to death of you. But what do they do? They're gonna go down in the ground and they're gonna eat baby rabbits and they're gonna eat moles and gophers and stuff like that. So they're actually your friend. In fact, gopher snakes, where I live in North County, San Diego, will leave a scent trail to get rid of rattlesnakes. So if you have a dominant gopher snake living on your property or in your backyard, that means that rattlesnakes are most likely not going to show up. So pretty kind of cool stuff. But we also want to consider building habitat uh, for, for such things as praying mantises, uh, ladybugs, uh, lace wigs, wing flies. Why, why do we want this? Uh, it's because when we get aphids and white flies and things like that, guess who moves to the rescue and works 24 seven for free and doesn't ask for a paycheck or a, or a bed to sleep on or a room to rent? Huh? Doesn't pay any taxes. The bugs, the beneficial bugs. So if we get rid of the bad bugs, even with stuff like neem oil, you know, a lot of people aren't realizing diatomaceous earth, you're killing the bees, you're killing the mantises and the ladybugs and uh, all that kind of stuff. And we don't really want to do that. We want to create a habitat where a home for these people, these, these bugs, these individuals, I call them people, but, um, that they, these individual life forms that will attract them, give them food, give them something to eat, and they'll stay there and they will actually help you. That's the true permaculture way. Instead of blocking everything in, we want to invite them in and create some sort of balance. Um, so that's what brings me into my next note is relying on nature for equilibrium and why you'll most likely going to have to do it yourself. So we fenced stuff off, we blocked a lot of things and that's not really good because just like I mentioned with the snakes, most likely if you're in an urban setting, you've probably never seen a snake in your life. It's because there's no habitat. There's no way for them to get in. You got your brick wall around you. There's uh, miles and miles of asphalt and all kinds of things. And if somebody did see them, very sadly to say, a lot of people run them over and it makes me very angry, pisses me off. Um, so I think one of the biggest struggles that I've had uh, gardening in urban settings uh, is, that, is like mice and rats. They will come in and eat all of your seedlings. So I look at this as, and you're probably going to trip out on this. Some of you guys are probably going to be like, that's not right. But you got to set mousetraps up and you got to kill the, the, the balance yourself. Uh, it's either you or it's them. There are tons of areas where people aren't trapping. Uh, please don't use poison, guys. The owls at nighttime, even in urban settings, uh, they will come if there's abundance of rats and mice. And they will eat loads, I forgot how many, ridiculous amounts of, of uh, gophers, voles, and mice and stuff like that. The problem is when you set out those traps, uh, it poisons the, the rat or the mouse or the gopher. And then guess what? The owl comes or the hawk comes to eat it and then they die. It's very sad to see dead owls laying around in all over the place. So the best thing you can do is set up mouse traps uh, yourself. And you're gonna have to, this is the role of nature. Things are born, things die. 
since we blocked it off from coyotes and rattlesnakes and stuff like that to keep in the balance of rats and mice and things of like that, in, in, in my opinion, um, we're going to need to set up those traps and take care of it ourselves. Um, I would prefer if you guys don't have the, uh, uh, I would say the guts, the guts really to do it, you know, to come out, to human up and actually be a part of that. And I understand a lot of people get upset and never had the experience of taking something's life, like a, a simple mouse or something like that. And it could be hard on you. But if you have the stomach for doing what I'm about to tell you, then go ahead and do this. I think my way is a lot more humane. But if you don't want to see it, instead of poisoning, and it's a lot cheaper and easier, go get yourself some bubble yum bubble gum. And you're going to stick this out uh, where, the, where the mice are. Instead of trapping and killing them, let them just eat the bubble gum. The problem is they're going to eat this bubble gum and they're going to die of constipation. It'll block up their digestive systems. And that's a very ugly way to die, in my opinion. But you don't have to deal with it. And if the owl comes and sweeps it up or the neighborhood cat, they're most likely not going to die eating a little piece of bubble gum. Uh, so that's that's my tip for there. Now, uh, uh, again, tying this all together to swale is my next um, uh, note here, or not to swale. For those of you who don't know what a swale is, it's basically a berm, like a curb, uh, that's going to hold water. You can imagine a, a horizontal uh, um, uh, pitched uh, backyard that's got a little bit of incline to it. When it rains, what happens to the rain? It gets on top of the soil and moves the path of least resistance, and, and the laws of gravity wants to go downhill. When we have stuff going downhill, we'll usually build ourselves a ditch that holds all that water in called the swale. And that will slowly allow the water to seep, in the, seep into the ground and then kind of make its way uh, down to where we want the, uh, it to land, where maybe our food or our little orchard or something is. Again, this is size matters because if you have a small backyard and you're putting in swales, which I've seen people do, that water is most likely going down your uh, past your fence and into your neighbor's yard and you saved it for maybe a little while. So depending on the size of your property, I think these swales and stuff that I see people do in your backyards, um, if it works for you, let me know. I would really like to know. But tell me if this, uh, put this hat on, wear this dress for a minute. Let's just imagine that all that water you're capturing from rain, which is happening around me, excuse if you can hear it in the background. Uh, how about if we looked and we actually captured this in rain barrels? Uh, with an overflow valve, of course, or pipe, so that it doesn't overflow up and, and you know, flood your basement or start ponding water everywhere on your, your uh, patio. Uh, pipe that extra water in, maybe set it off to where it goes out in the street, and just fill up just your, uh, your rain barrels or your totes, whatever you're doing. I see a lot of people doing this, capturing rainwater from roofs and stuff like that. What if we took these things and we raised them up a little bit higher to utilize gravity, and instead of digging swales, Let's go and just soak the ground. Uh, like if you maybe if you're into the permaculture thing and you do want to swale, how about oh, at nighttime we just let out say I don't know about 20 gallons. We let that seep into the into the ground. Why would you want to do that at nighttime? So that when the, the the sun's not out, evaporating that amount of water right off the surface of the soil. Leave it in all night. Set your swale, your ditch, way at the top incline. And trust me, if you think your land is flat, it's not. Uh, you've got an incline. You've got places where there's little puddles and stuff like that. So find the highest point, dig yourself a little trench, and if you keep feeding the water in that slowly throughout the dry seasons, what's going to happen is that water is going to seep in. It's going to start moving very, very slow. You guys got to imagine that that water's got these obstacles like sand and, and clay and all these things it has to move move towards. It's going to sink down as, as to a certain level till it, he, it hits a hard pan or stone or whatever you've got at the bottom. And then it's going to slowly start moving downwards. If that water moves downwards, it's going to be soaked up by your plants and most likely uh, used up. And you can continue this cycle instead of wasting all of that water, having your plants flooded for just a season, getting all that moisture in there, which will last, you know, depending on where you live in your climate, the heat and everything, the type of soil you have, maybe it'll last a month or two. But then after that, it's moving on, whatever's not used by the trees and your plants. And that's going over to your neighbor's backyard or towards the local water supply. Uh, so if you keep feeding it just little by little and storing that water basically in the ground in little increments. So if it's captured in a plastic uh, vessel where it's not evaporation, and it's not being heated by the sun, it can actually let out little spurts, if that makes sense. And we're just slowly filling up the gas tank every single uh, night uh, or every other night, whatever, or weekly. And that way you get the best of that rainwater and the best usage of it instead of just wasting it all. That's uh, at least my opinion, uh, whether to swale or not to swale. All right, so the best thing that you can do, uh, we are running out of time here, is uh, 
uh, vertical applications, especially for small, small areas, even on half an acre. Once you start going vertical, it changes everything. Um, this philosophy here in life is, I think, could be used beyond gardening. Uh, for instance, when you build a house, like they say, the air, there's no taxes in the air. So when you build up, you don't pay more property taxes because you still have basically the same square footage. The more size you take out outwards, the more money you pay. Well, it's the same thing that you're going to pay in, in the design of your backyard, your permaculture urban backyard. Uh, you're going to, there's only so much land you can use if you started doing aquaponics, uh, hydroponics, uh, hyd uh, what is that, uh, aeroponics, raised beds, wicking beds, and all these kind of things. If you take over the whole entire surface, you're using up all the flat land. As soon as we go and trellis something like, say, zucchini, uh, which are definitely uh, able to be done, uh, your tomatoes, your... Uh, your cucumbers and things like that almost so many things could be trellised guys. It's not just uh, uh, Beans and stuff like that, but we start utilizing the air and now it starts bringing up more space And now we can start layering things uh, For instance, you guys can take my drop and forget method, which is just grab some bunch of seeds save yourself some seedlings from like uh, uh, What is it celery which I did I let a celery plant just grow Did it do anything to it? It just went to seed. I didn't harvest the seeds or nothing. Everything died on the bush. The wind came and just blew these tiny little seeds everywhere. Now I've got uh, like a mess, like weeds of celery just popping up out of every crevice and corner, even at between bricks and stuff like that, guys. Uh, I, I pick them small and eat them like microgreens. Uh, and some of them I just leave. You can do this with multiple different species. So when you have the trellises up, say your beans and stuff like that, uh, especially if you understand that a lot of legumes like beans are actually um, uh, nitrogen fixtures in the soil. They'll produce nitrogen. So if you go and stick stuff such as spinach and lettuce and stuff that doesn't need quite full sun all the time, especially in the summertime, you can start growing those type of things like, like lettuces and spinaches and other things. Now what happens if we have tiny little seeds such as like microgreen seeds uh, where you, if you just collect a bunch of uh, celery, and you can do this with anything, radishes, beets, and you just cast those seeds underneath the lettuce and everything, now you got another layer of growing. That's the uh, like the seven layer food force you guys probably hear in, in a lot of these permaculture demonstrations. Here in your tiny little backyard, you're actually growing up to three things, in which you can go even more, more than three things. You're growing three things right now, though, just off the ideas I gave you in one tiny square foot. So when we start looking at this abundance, uh, there's no stopping you. Once you get the mindset and you start understanding about how these things work, uh, it's unstoppable, man. There's it's just there's so much creativity. And speaking of creativity, the more restrictive the space is, the more creativity unfolds and the more productivity. Jeff Lawton, the Prince of Permaculture, actually said that per square foot, when he's seen little tiny structures, urban uh, environments where they're practicing permaculture, they're actually producing sometimes twice to three to even four times more than the huge areas because we start seeing like, you know, 50 acres or um, 50 acres is really big, I would say, but you get somebody with a five acre piece of property and they're looking more at the surface and it's a lot easier for them to just go and, and start planting stuff here, planting stuff there and utilizing most of the horizontal space. Um, Whereas when you start getting restricted and you're, you're hanging ferns on the fences and you're hanging trellises and things like that, creating little water features, uh, you start to develop things and start to tighten, niche things together and try to figure out as much as you can compact in there. You're growing a heck of a lot more per square foot. I think if you took this mentality and this practice and you got good at doing this in a small square footage and then applied that, make, start out at a, a tenth of an acre. Then as you move up and say you want to get a piece of property that's a half an acre or something, what you'll be able to do with that half an acre is just, it's insane. You'll just blow the whole place up and you can have full abundance. And that's when I look at, I was talking earlier in my research, it's debatable that one acre can, is the minimal amount to sustain a person. When I looked at these videos and things that people were doing, uh, it was very flat. Now I'm not sure, they didn't go into full detail because just like this show, they're probably on a lot of so much time. Uh, but I noticed a lot of stuff was flat. It was all in rows and things like that. I didn't notice a lot of vertical stuff happening there. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot. And when I say vertical too, guys, quail. You can put quail in cages. They'll drop their, their poop down. You can put ducks underneath that, which is uh, kind of questionable for me of them eating dung. But I guess that's what people do. The ducks go in. They, they eat all the scraps and obviously, I guess, the, uh, the quail poop. 
and then they'll go into the little pond that you make them even if you have just two ducks they're going to poop inside that water uh, and what you're going to do is drain that water every day and guess what you're going to do you're going to put that over in your little swale or you're going to put that as fertilizer over your garden you're going to keep continually cleaning that water out permaculture if you guys uh, started to get the bug yet if it hasn't bit you get into it once you get rolling if i've inspired you today and you see the possibilities it starts to go into everything the philosophy is huge especially for the lifetime of the show a lot of the the things that i think about in life are not just about growing your own food and living a symbiotic uh, uh relationship having a symbiotic relationship with nature you start to see how things work and this is what i call lessons from nature then we start to look at business we start to look at money and distribution and uh, relationships all of these things the health of you Everything is one. Everything has this, this system uh, that it's involved in, whether you like it or not. You're involved with the, the water around you. You're involved with the, the oxygen and the soil and the microbiology. The things you do affect it. The things it does affects you. So when we take this understanding, it takes us on a very deep spiritual and self, I think, uh, fulfillment journey. And we start. it starts to open your eyes to, to many, many things and starts to show you the light uh, and when we're surrounded with so much darkness and neg negativity. Okay, guys, that's the end of the show. And I just want to thank each and every one of you guys for being here today and taking the time to listen. And if I brought you guys any value of any type, please, and only if I gave you guys some value, like, subscribe, give me a thumbs up, a thumbs down. If you gave me a thumbs down, tell me why. I would love to hear your opinion on the subject matter. But it really helps the algorithms for the show to get out. And if I've given you something in return, please feel free to share this show, comment. All of those things help us to develop and keep this show up and running. If you guys want to get a hold of me, the email is down below. It's up and in at show at gmail.com. So guys, as I always say, go out there and have yourself a near life experience. Don't lose your muchness. Carry on the fire. Human up, live it, love it, own it, and bone it, my friends.